development of central nervous system it is divided into various parts so this is the topic for today's discussion central nervous system development part 1 the learning objectives are development of neural tube and its subdivisions development of neural crest and development of spinal cord so neural tube is divided into various stages of development and it is developed from the ectoderm apart from its blood vessels and some neuroglial elements the whole of the nervous system is derived from the ectoderm so here is a section of the embryonic disc here is the neural ectoderm neuroectoderm here is the surface ectoderm here is the mesoderm divided into various parts paraaxial intermediate and lateral plate of mesoderm and notochord notochord has got a inductive effect on the development of the neural tube so here is the neuroectoderm from this part the neural tube has been divided uh, derived so first stage is the neuroectoderm and neural plate stage which is uh, at the stage of pre somoid period on the 16th and 19th day of intrauterine in life so it is the first stage of development of the neural tube so this is the first stage of development of the neural tube this ectoderm is situated on the dorsal aspect of the embryonic disc which ectoderm that is the neuroectoderm and in the midline and overlies the notochordal process so it is a dorsal view of the no, uh, developing embryonic disc and here is the slipper shape is the notochordal uh, that is the neural plate and which overlies over the notochordal process which overlies over the notochordal process and here is the neural plate and just above the primitive knot so it become thickened and forms the neural plate it become thickened so this is the neuroectodermal plate derived from the neuroectoderm and which overlies over the notochordal process notochordal process that has got a inductive effect on the development of the neural tube so it is the first stage of development of the neural tube that is the neuroectoderm and neural plate stage of the neural tube development so these are the various steps in the development of the neural tube here is the cross section of the embryonic disc and again here is the notochord and here is the surface ectoderm and in the midline over the notochordal process it become thickened and that forms the neuroectoderm and that is nothing but the thickening of this plate leading to the formation of the neural plate leading to the formation of the neural plate and also lateral aspect of it it get divided or get derived in the form of the neural crest cells get derived in the form of the neural crest cells here the neural tube get depressed and forms the neural groove that is the neural plate get depressed and form the neural groove and here the last stage that is the formation of the neural tube we will discuss one by one these processes so first stage is the neural plate stage neuroectoderm stage so this is the section taken at which level so this is the dorsal view of the embryonic disc dorsal view of the embryonic disc section is taken at this level and here we can see a neural neuroectoderm in the form of the neural plate in the form of the neural plate and here is the surface ectoderm here is the surface ectoderm here the section is taken at this level and here just a depression of the neural tube leading to the formation of the neural groove and this neural groove is bounded on each side by the neural folds this neural groove is bounded by the folds known as the neural folds and also lateral to the neural fold there is the presence of the neural crest cells neural crest cells so here is the neural groove second step of development of the neural tube here the section is taken at slightly upper level and here is the neural tube the edges coming nearer to each other and these edges meet with each other and form the neural tube and here is the last stage in the formation of the neural tube and dorsolateral to it there is the presence of the 
neural crest cells neural crest cells so these are the various views of the dorsal aspect of the neural tube that is the uh, embryonic disc dorsal aspect of the embryonic disc and the sections are taken at the various stages so second step we will discuss again the neural groove and fold stage that is the somite period between 20th and the 21st day the neural plate become depressed around the midline as a result of which the neural groove is formed so here is the neural plate it get depressed in the midline and forms the neural groove and here the edges come to each other and divide this tube into the form, uh, divide this tube in the formation of the neural tube these are the neural crest cells the two edges come nearer to each other and lead to the formation of the neural groove or the neural tube so this is the second step of the development of the neural tube formation neural groove and fold stage third stage is the neural tube stage at this age the somite period will be 22nd to 25th day and the formation of neural tube will lead to the formation of the neural tube but it does not progress throughout the extent of the neural tube it in the in the middle part only it becomes a tubular and for some time the neural tube is open cranially and caudal so this is the st third step of formation of the neural tube formation of the neural tube and it does not proceed simultaneously all over the length of the all over the length of the tube only in the middle part there is a the presence of the neural tube formation and cranially and caudally it remains open cranially and caudally it remains open these parts are known as the neuropores anterior neuropore and the posterior neuropore this is the third step in the formation of the neural tube first stage is the neuroectodermal or neural plate stage second step is in the formation of the neural groove and neural folds phase and third phase is the neural plate or the somite period uh, that is the somite period is 22nd and 25th day of intrauterine life so this is about the three phases in relation with the somite formation so that we have to see in relation with the formation of the neural tube so openings of the neural tube openings of these are the neural folds these are the neural folds here is the anterior opening known as anterior neuropore here is the posterior opening is known as the posterior neuropore and in the midline there is a formation of the neural tube formation in the midline there is a formation of the neural tube formation and on lateral side of it there are the presence of the somite which we have to discuss in relation with the day of the somite period and just lateral to the somite will be the pericardial bulge here is the pericardial bulge and here is the cut edge of the amnion so this is the dorsal view of the embryonic plate embryonic disc so this is the cut edge of the amnion here is the somite period and here is the extent of the formation of the neural tube has placed anteriorly as well as the posteriorly and only formation of the two neuropores and these are the cranial neuropore and the caudal neuropore caudal neuropore and the plate that is the fusion of all these plate that is neural plate extend cranially as well as the caudally and the neuropores will disappear leading to a closed neuropore neural tube that is the closed neural tube so these are the openings of the neural tube openings of the neural tube with the three stages and in relation with the somite formation in relation with the somite formation so these are the openings of the neural tube then the closure of the neuropores closure of the neuropore occur at the day of the 25th day and that is the beginning of the fourth week beginning of the fourth week that is the 20th stomite stage that is the 20th stomite stage and where the where the anterior neuropore present it is seen in the adult in the form of the lamina terminalis what is lamina terminalis it is a commissural plate which joins the two parts of the telencephalon telencephalon that is the cerebral hemisphere from which the cerebral hemisphere develops and from that commissural plate all the commissural fibers of the brain will develop 
so that is known as the lamina terminalis and it forms the anterior boundary for the third ventricle it forms the anterior boundary for the third ventricle that is the anterior neuropore and location in case of the adults location in the case of the adults that is the third anterior boundary of the third ventricle here is the first neuropore second neuropore that is the posterior neuropore closes on 28th day that is the end of the fourth week that is the end of the fourth week and now they will be the 25th somite stage they will be the 25th somite stage and what is the adult location of the posterior neuropore that is in the form of the terminal ventricle present in the proximal 5 to 6 mm of phylum terminal in the adults the posterior neuropore represents the terminal ventricle present in the proximal 5 to 6 mm of phylum terminal proximal 5 to 6 mm of phylum terminal that is present in the spinal cord that is present in the lower end of the spinal cord and from there will be a pile process that is a pyometric process will emerges and runs downward up to the coccyx that is known as the phylum terminal and there is a presence of a ventricular cavity within the spinal cord and that cavity is known as the terminal ventricle that cavity is known as the terminal ventricle and that is the site of the posterior neuropore in case of the spinal cord in case of the spinal cord the first neuropore was in relation with the cerebral hemisphere that is the lamina terminalis while in the, the second neuropore is in relation with the caudal end that is the caudal end they will be the spinal cord end that is and in relation with that that is the phylum terminal so there will be the closure of the anterior neuropore and the posterior neuropore in relation with the somite period 25th that is the end of the fourth week end of the fourth week so this is the model known as the formation of the neural tube and differentiation of somite here is the surface ectoderm here is the neuroectoderm grooving of the neural ectoderm leading to the formation of the second stage known as the neuroecto neural groove and neural fold stage these are the folds and here will be the somite in meanwhile there is a differentiation of somite into three parts that is the sclerotome dermatome and the myotome that is the differentiation of the somite and in the second third step there is the formation of the closed neural tube there is the formation of the closed neural tube and these are the somites these are the somites with the cavity in, in in the center and here is the differentiation of somite with again differentiation of the neural tube also in the three layers in the middle layer that is the near the central cavity will be the ependymal layer second will be the mental layer and third will be the marginal layer marginal layer so in the meanwhile there is a formation of the differentiation of the somite as well as the differentiation of the neural tube also going on in relation with the somite and the neural tube phases here is the formation of the dors dorsal root dorsal root ganglion and the motor component uh, that is the sensory component of the spinal now and here is the ventral root that is the motor root and here is the motor component of the spinal now so formation of the ventral and dorsal root of the spinal cord also going on and here is the again differentiation of the neural tube with differentiation of the somite this is the myotome and this one is the dermatome dermatome so these are the embryonic model known as the formation of the neural tube and differentiation of somite and differentiation of somite along with the differentiation of the neural tube is also going on the differentiation of neural tube also going on so differentiation of the neural tube we have cleared the neural tube so it consists of a central cavity it can so this is a central cavity and here is the peripheral wall and it is divided into three groups and this central part is the cavity that will get terminated into the ventricles ventricles and this whole wall, floor lateral wall of the neural plate, neural tube lead to the formation of the whole brain the wall will give rise to the whole brain while the cavity will give rise to the ventricles of the brain give rise to the ventricles of the brain and here is the roof plate of the neural tube 
here is the floor plate of the neural tube and these are the lateral walls of the lateral walls of the neural tube and these walls give rise to the whole brain system that is the all brain parts cerebral hemisphere diencephalon metencephalon myelencephalon and all these things and here is the differentiation of the neural tube into its three layers middle portion is known as the germinal layer or the matrix layer or the uh, ependymal layer middle portion is known as the mental layer and lateral one that is the outermost covering is known as the marginal layer and the mental layer grows faster the mental layer grows faster as the, there is a growth of the mental layer there is a formation of a dorsoventral cleft there is a formation of a dorsoventral cleft and that cleft give rise to a sulcus known as the sulcus limitans so from the mental layer fast growth will occur and from the mental layer as there is a uh, fast growth will be there the there is a compression of the these uh, root plate and the floor plate of the neural tube and in the middle there is a sulcus known as the sulcus terminalis so that will be the differentiation of the neural tube the differential rate of growth and subdivisions of the neural tube so neural tube has got a central part that is the cranial part and the caudal part cranial part give rise to the brain of the central nervous system while the caudal tubular part forms the spinal cord and again later on it is divided into various layers various parts these are from the brain there will be two parts prosencephalon and the mesencephalon while the spinal cord has been in, included in the rhombencephalon that is the lower most part again this rhombencephalon is divided into metencephalon and the myelencephalon so here is the differential rate of growth and subdivisions of the neural tube into cranial and the caudal part and its various divisions so parts of the cavity of the developing brain it shows three dilatation craniocaudally which are these craniocaudal dilatations the cranial most will be the prosencephalon middle will be the mesencephalon and the lower one that is the caudal one is the rhombencephalon and in as there is a growth of these three uh, three parts developing brain three parts of the developing brain there will be formation of the flexures in relation with these three parts which are these that we will see here is the first flexure known as the cervical flexure here is the first flexure known as the cervical flexure the rhombencephalon is divided into two groups cranial will be the metencephalon and caudal will be the myelencephalon then there is the mesencephalon and here is the prosencephalon again there is a second flexure will be the pontine flexure this cervical flexure near the spinal cord and the rhombencephalon and that is known as the cervical flexure and second flexure is the pontine flexure second flexure is the pontine flexure in relation with the metencephalon and the mesencephalon and third will be the cephalic flexure or the mesencephalic flexure and fourth flexure will be the telencephalic flexure fourth flexure is in relation with the telencephalon so prosencephalon is divided into two parts prosencephalon is divided into two parts these are known as the diencephalon from which thalamus and hypothalamus will develop and second will be the telencephalon from which the cerebral hemisphere will develop from the telencephalon there will be development of the cerebral hemisphere so these are the parts of the cavity of the developing brain and the its various divisions so the telencephalon consists of the right and left telencephalic vesicles and the rhombencephalon is divided into a cranial part known as metencephalon and a caudal part is known as the myelencephalon and here is the mesencephalic flexure here is the mesencephalic flexure so these are the flexures now we will see the cavities the prosencephalon mesencephalon and rhombencephalon are at first arranged craniocaudally and their relative position is altered by the appearance of number of flexures number of flexures these are the same flexures here is the cervical flexure between the myelencephalon and the spinal cord 
it is the pontine flexure pontine flexure it is the mesencephalic flexure at the week 5 of the brain stage development and here is the telencephalon that is the cerebral vesicles and here is the diencephalon from which the thalamus and hypothalamus will develop so these are the parts of the forebrain midbrain and the hindbrain when the cavity that is the various parts of the cavity that is the prosencephalon mesencephalon and the and the telencephalon will develop then these are altered by the presence of these three flexures the first flexure we will discuss that is the cervical flexure here is the cervical flexure why it is known as cervical flexure because it is related to the cervical part of the spinal cord it is concave ventrally this is the ventral surface of the developing brain and this one is the dorsal surface of the developing brain and here is the uh, cervical uh, that is the cervical flexure which is concave ventrally here is the concave ventrally and it makes a 90 degree angle between the hind brain and the spinal cord it makes a 90 degree angle between the hind brain and the spinal cord that is known as the cervical flexure at the junction of rhombencephalon here is the rhombencephalon and the spinal cord which is the part of the cervical part of the spinal cord and here is the concave ventrally cervical flexure of the developing brain second flexure is the mesencephalic flexure here is the mesencephalic flexure these are the various parts telencephalon diencephalon mesencephalon rhombencephalon this blue colored and here is the spinal cord here is the spinal cord and this is known as the mesencephalic flexure mesencephalic flexure and this is uh, sorry this one is the mesencephalic flexure and this flexure is again concave ventrally this is again concave ventrally and here is the pontine flexure which is convex ventrally it is differentiating feature of the pontine flexure is that it is convex ventrally it is convex ventrally and these two flexures cervical and mesen this one is the cervical flexure and this is the mesencephalic flexure these are concave ventrally these are concave ventrally so this one is the pontine flexure pontine flexure which is convex ventrally and it is present mid in the middle of the rhombencephalon that is nothing but the here is the myelencephalon here is the metencephalon is the metencephalon and in the middle of this there is a presence of a flexure known as the pontine flexure and in relation with the midbrain that is the mesencephalon that is nothing but a future midbrain and this is second flexure cephalic flexure in the region of the midbrain that is concave ventrally concave ventrally so these are the flexures and that will give rise to the future parts of the brain and that lead to the formation of the adult form of brain the telencephalic flexure which occurs much later between the telencephalon and the diencephalon that is the last flexure that is the last flexure here is this flexure here in the region of the cerebral hemisphere here it will be the flexure telencephalic flexure this flexure lead to the orientation of the various parts of brain as in case of the adult so this is the development of the external from form of the human brain human brain here is the telencephalon diencephalon and these are the flexures mesencephalon metencephalon and the cervical flexure and in the second diagram here is the formation of the rhombic lip which is nothing but the formation of a lip from the dorsoventral part of the alar lamina of the alar lamina of the metencephalon and that is known as the cerebellum that is known as the rhombic lip from which the cerebellum develops in the third diagram again orientation will be changed the diencephalon will be the uh, formation of the hypothalamus and the thalamus and uh, the cerebellum is divided into two parts here is the ex extraventricular part and here is the intraventricular part the extraventricular part is slightly larger in nature as compared to the intraventricular part and formation of the slight form of the adult brain and in this case there is the development of the external form of the human brain there is the formation of the external form of the human brain that is the thalamus hypothalamus midbrain pons medulla 
medulla from here to the medulla and here the cerebellum so how the flexures will lead to the formation of the adult brain this picture is going to show us about the formation of the adult form of brain adult form of brain that that now the cavity of the telencephal that will be the flexures to up till now up till now we have discussed the stages of the formation of the neural tube it's three stages in relation with the somoid period then the number of the flexures how the three flexures again three flexures will be there and leading to the formation of the adult form of brain adult form of brain now the second part will be the cavity of the so from the wall differentiation of the neural tube we have seen from the wall whole brain will develop and from the cavity the ventricles will develop ventricles will develop now we will see the ventricles the cavity of each telencephalic vesicle become the lateral ventricle diagrammatically also i will show you that of the diencephalon become the third ventricle and the cavity of the mesencephalon remains narrow and forms the aqueduct while the rhombencephalon forms the fourth ventricle and the continuation of the spinal cord is the central canal so here is the diagram development of the ventricle here is the telencephalon the cavity of the telencephalon is known as the lateral ventricle cavity of the diencephalon means thalamus and the hypothalamus will be known as the third ventricle this is the mesencephalon midbrain the cavity of the midbrain is known as the cerebral aqueduct and here is the fourth ventricle here is the fourth ventricle which is the cavity of the rhombencephalon which is the cavity of the rhombencephalon known as the cavity of the rhombencephalon that is the junction between the myelencephalon and the metencephalon and lower down will be the spinal cord lower down will be the spinal cord and from the spinal cord is there will be the cavity known as the central canal so these are the cavities and whole this wall give rise to the brain whole this wall give rise to the brain give rise to the brain the tissue of actual tissue and here is the ventricles are the cavity of the brain system here is the cavity of the whole brain system these are the vesicles again only one thing is optic vesicle and this optic vesicle from the arises from the diencephalon and leading to the formation of the eyeball and all this thing here is the cerebral hemisphere and its cavity again the diencephalon and its cavity cerebral aqueduct cavity of mesencephalon fourth ventricle cavity of the metencephalon and the myelencephalon and here is the spinal cord here is the spinal cord so these are the brain vesicles and the adult derivatives of the cavity second part is the neural crest cells neural crest cells here is the embryonic disc and here is the formation of the notochord notochord has got a inductive effect on the formation of the neural plate so at the junction between the neural plate and rest of the ectoderm this is the junction this is the junction here is the junction between the junction between the neuroectoderm neural plate neural plate and the rest of the ectoderm and the rest of the ectoderm this junction give rise to the neural plate say Uh, neural crest cells neural crest cells so this junction becomes specialized and give rise to the various parts of the various parts various derivatives are there embryonic derivatives and that derivatives give rise to the arise from the neural crest cells this becomes specialized and from the primordia of the neural crest cells are the neural crest derivatives it is at the junction of the neural plate neuroectoderm neuroectoderm and the surface ectoderm and the surface ectoderm so this is known as the neural crest cells neural crest cells these are formed at the junction between neural plate and rest of the ectoderm become specialized to form the primordia of the neural crest primordia of the neural crest with the separation of the neural tube from the surface ectoderm in this diagram separation of the neural tube from the surface uh, from the rest of the surface ectoderm there is a formation of the neural crest cells there is a formation of the neural crest cells the cells of the neural crest appear as groups of cells lying along the dorsolateral sides of the neural tube lies along the dorsolateral sides of the neural tube the neural crest cells become free by losing the property of cell to cell cohesiveness and they migrate to different places of throughout the body 
so these derivative are scattered throughout the body between in the form of a different different parts of the body nervous system peripheral nervous system ganglia some cells all these things are der derivatives of the neural crest cells all these are the derivatives of the neural crest cells which are the derivatives of the neural crest derivative these are following neurons of the spinal posterior root or the dorsal nerve root ganglia number 2 the neurons that is the dorsal root ganglia number 2 neurons of the sensory ganglia of the 5th 7th 8th 9th and the 10th cranial nerve these are the sensory ganglia the neurons and the satellite cells of the sympathetic ganglia the pre aortic ganglia the neurons and the satellite cells of the sympathetic ganglia so these are the few derivatives of the neural crest cells dorsal root ganglia sensory ganglia of the 5th 7th 8th 9th and 10th cranial nerve the neurons and the satellite cells of the sympathetic ganglia the pre aortic ganglia the neurons and satellite cells of the parasympathetic ganglia of the cranial nerve For which are the parasympathetic ganglia ciliary ganglia in relation with the eyeball submandibular ganglia pterygo palatine ganglia that is known as the spino palatine ganglia and the otic ganglia these are the parasympathetic ganglia of the cranial nerve parasympathetic ganglia of the cranial nerve ciliary submandibular and the spino palatine and the otic this is the fourth derivative fifth derivative is the parasympathetic ganglia enteric ganglia of the gastrointestinal tract and ganglia related to the pelvic viscera ganglia related to the pelvic viscera schwann cells that are the covering of the neurilemmal sheath of the peripheral nerves these are also derivatives of the neural crest cells these are the derivatives of the neural crest cells so specific cells of the adrenal medulla the chromaffin tissue the pigment cells of the skin specific cells of the adrenal medulla chromaffin tissue and the pigment cells this is the important thing in relation with the pharyngeal arches we have seen the cells arising from the cranial part of neural crest migrate into the mesenchymal of the head and neck and influence development of the somatomeres leading to the head neck face mesenchymal and this mesenchymal lead to the formation of the development of the somatomeres and it has got a role in the development of the musculature of the head and formation of the face musculature of the head and the formation of the face so these are the various derivatives of the ventral mass and dorsal mass of the neural crest cells these are number one melanoblast capsular cells are the satellite cells of the sympathetic ganglia or the dorsal root ganglia dorsal root ganglia and the neuroblast schwann cells schwann cells are also derived from the neural crest cells then the schwann cells then the ciliary ganglia ciliary ganglia the otic ganglia submandibular ganglia enteric ganglia these are the derivatives of the neural crest cells these are the derivatives of the sympathetic ganglia these are the para aortic bodies that are also derivative of the ventral mass of the neural crest adrenal medulla and the sympathetic ganglia so these are the uh, various derivatives of the neural crest cells various derivatives here is the again second diagram these are the schwann cell again derived from the neural crest cells here is the neural tube neural crest cells surface ectoderm notochord and all these derivatives of the neural crest cells that is the schwann cells cells of adrenal medulla cells of autonomic ganglia cells of posterior root ganglia and the ganglia of the cranial nerves and the melanocytes and the melanocytes so these are the various derivatives of the neural crest few structures are believed to arise from the neural crest cells these are as following the pia mater and the arachnoid mater mesenchymal of the dental papilla odontoblast and the dentin bones of the face and part of the vault of skull frontal parietal squamous temporal part of sphenoid maxilla zygomatic nasal vomer palatine and mandible the bones of the face that are also believed to arise from the neural crest cells dermis and smooth muscle fat of face and the ventral aspect of neck muscles of ciliary body sclera and choroid of the eye sclera and choroid these are the layers of the eyeball substantia propria and the posterior epithelium of the cornea 
can acute issue of thyroid, parathyroid, thymus, and salivary glands. Derivatives of the first, second, and third pharyngeal cartilages, C cells of the thyroid gland, cardiac semilunar walls, and conotruncal septum. You may have a short note on the neural crest derivatives. So, up till now, we have seen the neural tube, various flexures, neural crest cells, how they form, where they form. Derivatives which are believed to arise from the neural crest and which are the actual derivatives of the neural crest cells. Now we will start with the development of the actual organs of the actual parts of the brain. That is the first part will be the spinal cord. First part will be the spinal cord. So the spinal cord it is developed from the caudal cylindrical part of the neural tube. That is the caudal cylindrical part just below the rhombal cephalon. When this part of neural tube is formed. Its cavity is in the form of a dorsoventral cleft and this cavity has got roof plate, floor plate and the lateral walls. So these are the formation steps in the formation of the spinal cord. Here is the roof plate, floor plate, lateral wall and here is the cavity which is leading to the formation of the central canal. Here is the central canal. Here is the central canal. Again, this tube is become compressed dorsoventrally, and this dorsoventral compression lead to the formation of a sulcus known as the sulcus limitus here. And the neural tube differentiate into various layers. Neural tube differentiate into various layers, and from the middle low, that is the medial to lateral side, the innermost layer is the ependymal layer or the matrix layer. The second layer is the mantle layer and third layer is the marginal layer. From the mental layer all the important grey matter will form. From the mental layer that is the, this grey matter will lead to the formation of the is derived from the mental layer of the mental layer of the neural tube mental layer of the neural tube. And so here is the formation of the dorsoventral cleft. The mental layer rapidly enlarges in size the mental layer rapidly enlarges in size so the ventral horn of the gray matter will become larger in size as compared to the dorsal horn of the dorsal horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord and here is the formation of the actual form leading to the formation of the longitudinal columns of the spinal cord we are going to discuss it and here is the lateral gray matter and the ventral horn and the uh, that is the dorsal horn of the grey matter, dorsal horn of the grey matter. Uh, these, all this grey matter layer is divided into various functional columns. That functional column lead to the formation of the, that is the cells of the and, uh, ventral horn of the spinal cord, cells of the posterior horn or the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, ascending tract, descending tract, dorsal nerve root and the ventral nerve root. So that all these parts are in relation with the mental layer of the spinal cord mental layer so here is the mental layer here is the ependymal layer and here is the marginal layer of the marginal layer of the neural tube and here is uh, from all these things so which part we are going to discuss in relation with the spinal cord formation actually sulcus limitans number one number two formation of the ventral horn formation of the dorsal horn formation of the dorsal nerve root formation of the ventral nerve root nerve root and then formation of the dorsal root ganglia that is from the neural crest and leading to the formation of the functional columns of the grey matter that are the general visceral efferent, general, uh, special visceral efferent, general somatic efferent, all these things we will discuss. So first differentiation of the neural tube into various layers, already we have seen roof plate, floor plate, lateral wall and the cavity and it is divided into various layers. These are the mental layer, marginal layer and ependymal layer or the germinal layer or the matrix layer, cell layer. Ma germinal layer or the matrix cell layer. These are three divisions of the three divisions of the, the neural tube and as there is growth in the mental layer, it becomes thicker than that of the dorsal part and lead to the formation of the ventral grey matter of the spinal cord. As a result, the lumen become compressed, lumen become compressed and a sulcus will be formed in relation with this cavity of the 
spinal cord and this sulcus is known as the sulcus limitans here is the sulcus limitans and as there is formation of the sulcus limitans the ventral horn and the ventral horn and the dorsal horn of spinal cord is divided into two lamina or two plates upper one plate is the alar lamina which is sensory in nature and lower one is the basal lamina which is motor in function and from these two plates four function components will be derived from this plate four components will be derived from this uh, alar lamina and the basal lamina that we will see so differentiation of the neural tube into three layers compression of the uh, compression of the ventral part and the dorsal part leading to the formation of the sulcus limitus after sulcus limitus formation there is a formation of the four functional columns of the spinal cord four functional columns of the spinal cord after the four functional columns of the spinal cord there is ventral root and the dorsal root formation so these are the alar lamini which are developed in the upper part which are sensory in nature so that is about the mental layer of the neural tube from the upper part so there is a development of the alar lamini and that is the sensory in nature and from the ventral part that is or the basal lamini that are the leading to the formation of the motor components of the spinal cord so here is in relation with the mental layer of the spinal cord mental layer of the spinal cord the division is of very functional importance and the basal lamina develops into structures that are motor in function and alar lamina into those that are sensory in nature the alar and basal lamina are also called as the alar and basal plates respectively alar and basal plates respectively so this is about the this is about the formation of the differentiation of the wall of the neural tube there is a formation of the cavity of the spinal cord and that cavity of the spinal cord is dorsally it is obliterated and there is a formation of the septum known as posterior median septum and in the ventral part it remains in the form of a cavity and that cavity is known as the central canal that rise in relation with the in between the two basal lamini anteriorly that is the ventral part two basal lamini there is a presence of a cavity fissure will be there that is known as the anterior median fissure that is known as the anterior median fissure lies between the two basal lamini and a part of cavity lies there and that cavity is known as a central canal that cavity is known as the central canal we will discuss the cavity of the central canal with growth in the mental layer the spinal cord gradually acquires its definitive form with growth of alar lamina the dorsal part become obliterated the dorsal part of the cavity the dorsal part just near the cavity will become obliterated and that obliterated cavity lead to the formation of the posterior median septum so here is the posterior median septum this is the dorsal part dorsal part get obliterated cavity we are discussing the cavity of the spinal cord the so posteriorly it gets obliterated and leading to the formation of the posterior median septum posterior median septum and here is the central canal ventrally it presents in the form of a cavity ventrally it presents in the form of a central canal in the form of a cavity that is known as the central canal and in the anteriorly there is a projecting between the two basal lamini of the two sides there is a presence of a anterior median fissure there is a presence of a anterior median fissure so here is the central canal ventral part of the cavity and posteriorly it get obliterated and that is known as the posterior median septum that is known as the posterior median septum and here is the anterior median fissure anterior median fissure so this is about the interlation so we have seen the mental layer mental layer with its two uh, two functional divisions alar plate and basal plate here is the basal plate and here is the alar plate second we have discussed the cavity of the spinal cord and its formation now third will be the longitudinal columns which are seen in relation with the alar and basal lamina that we will discuss in relation with the spinal cord each lamina reveal lamina reveals two columns two afferent columns which are sensory in nature and they receive axons from the dorsal root ganglia so dorsal root ganglia is sensory in nature so lamina which is related near to sensory division is the alar lamina that is the alar lamina which is also known as the 
alar plate of the spinal cord alar plate of the spinal cord so these are the functional columns these are divided into so this one is the alar lamina here is the marginal plate marginal plate and here is the ependymal plate here is the sulcus limitans and just above it will be the alar lamina and here is the basal lamina here is the basal lamina so which are the functional components of the alar lamina these are the general somatic afferent second general visceral afferent from the basal lamina general visceral efferent fourth will be general somatic efferent so visceral and somatic will be there visceral and somatic component will be there and the visceral component and the general component will be nearer to the sulcus limitans nearer to the sulcus limitan so these are the general visceral efferent column this is the general visceral efferent column and here is the general somatic efferent column general somatic efferent column which is also known as the alar lamina from the sensory components so these are the efferents these are the efferents and these are the efferents these are the efferents motor in nature these basal lamina structures functional component derived from the basal lamina are the motor in function and these are the structures in the sensory in function so first component is the general somatic efferent column it extends throughout the spinal cord and receives impulses from superficial and deep receptors receive impulses from superficial and deep receptors that is cutaneous and proprioceptive this is the efferent column extend throughout the spinal cord second column is the general visceral efferent column which is nothing but the sympathetic column which is seen in the thoracolumbar region lateral part in the lateral plate of the gray matter these receive impulses from viscera and blood vessels so which is this component here is the component viscera general visceral efferent column general visceral efferent column and here is the general somatic efferent column general somatic efferent column so these are known as the longitudinal columns of the alar plate of the alar plate of the spinal cord second the basal component basal or alar lamina component it these are confined to the thoracolumbar and the sacral region again visceral component thoracolumbar and the sacral region and provide preganglionic fiber to the viscera glands and blood vessels viscera glands and blood vessels so these are the components general visceral efferent component which is nothing but the again sympathetic in nature sympathetic in nature receive the impulses from viscera blood vessels and second component which is seen in the basal lamina is the general somatic efferent column here is the general somatic efferent column like that of the efferent it also extends throughout the extent of the spinal cord and provides fiber that innervate the skeletal muscle that innervate the skeletal muscle so these are the four longitudinal column in case of the spinal cord but in case of the brain stem there are seven longitudinal columns of the functional components of the cranial nerve so these are the four longitudinal column in the basal plate and the alar plate of the spinal cord basal plate and the alar plate of the spinal cord the development of now the ventral and dorsal spinal nerve roots so up till now we have seen the differentiation of the neural tube in relation with the spinal cord formation of the cavity of the spinal cord formation of the functional components of the spinal cord that is the alar plate basal plate and its various four columns and its development now what is remaining that is the length of the spinal cord and the formation of the ventral nerve root and the dorsal nerve root of the spinal cord ventral nerve root and dorsal nerve root of the spinal cord so we have to first discuss the cells in the anterior gray column cells in the anterior gray column we have to discuss these cells see now the nerve cells that develop in the mental zone of basal lamina form the neurons of the anterior gray column the nerve cells that develop in mental zone of the basal lamina become the neurons of the anterior gray column the axon of these cells grow out of the ventrolateral angle of the spinal cord to form the ventral nerve roots of the spinal nerve so the ventrolateral aspect of the spinal cord give rise to the ventral nerve roots of the spinal nerves which are these these are axons from the cells which are grow out from the 
neurons of the anterior gray column neurons of the anterior gray column development of the spinal axons of the second the development dorsal root of the spinal cord which is also known as, known as the posterior root ganglion or the posterior gray column these are sensory neurons of the second order these are sensory neurons of the second order means ascending tracts we are, you are going to discuss all these things in for the classes of the neuroanatomy so this is a second order neuron of the ascending tract fiber for example anterior spinothalamic tract lateral spinothalamic tract first first neuron will be from the periphery second neuron sensory neuron from the cells of the neurons of the posterior gray column cells of the neurons of the posterior gray column their axons travel predominantly upward in the marginal layer to form the ascending tracts of the spinal cord their axons travel predominantly upward in the marginal layer to form the ascending tracts of the spinal cord and these will be the fibers which give rise to the ascending tract that is the white matter formation of the spinal cord so here is the first order neuron this is the lateral spinothalamic tract and this is the second order neuron which is derived from the cells of the which is derived from the cells of the this is the posterior root column gray column posterior root gray column and from here the fibers will run upward this is the lateral spinothalamic tract and from here the second order neuron runs upward up to the thalamus so this is a pathway for the lateral spinothalamic tract here i want to show you the second order neuron and how the second order neuron reaches up to the upper part and that will give rise to the second order neuron which are nothing but the cells derived from the ventral uh, dorsal gray column of the spinal cord so this is a picture to show you how the ventral nerve root is formed from the axons of neurons in the ventral gray column what is this this is the basal lamina again this is the mental layer and here is the marginal layer how the dorsal nerve root and its ganglia will be formed the dorsal nerve root ganglia is derived from the neural crests we have seen and it is a pseudo unipolar ganglion it is a pseudo pseudo unipolar cells are there here is the central process and here is the peripheral process here is the peripheral process so the central process reaches up to the reaches up to the mental layer and from this mental layer it give rise to the, the that is the dorsal nerve root ganglion so these cells give rise to the dorsal nerve root dorsal nerve root of the spinal cord and from the cells from the dorsal gray column enter into the marginal layer here is the marginal layer and from this new axons axons of the cells of the dorsal gray column enter into the marginal layer and from here they will form the ascending tracts of the spinal cord from here they will form the ascending tracts of the spinal cord so here is the dorsal nerve root uh, dorsal nerve root formation ventral nerve root formation from the axons of neurons in the ventral gray column which are nothing but the parts of mental layer mental layer of neural tube mental layer of neural tube so we have seen the formation of the dorsal root ventral root ascending tracts and all these things so here is again a formation of the dorsal nerve root from the cells of the processes that is the central cells of the pseudo unipolar cells of the dorsal root ganglia leading to the formation of the dorsal nerve root and this ganglia is derived from the that is the dorsal root ganglia is derived from the uh, cells these cells are known as the form the dorsal root ganglia dorsal root ganglia again the cells are divided into two groups here is the central process here is the peripheral process central process forms the dorsal nerve root and the, uh, the peripheral process form the sensory component of the spinal nerve sensory component of the spinal nerve so here are the two processes two processes central process and the peripheral process of the the uh, pseudo unipolar cells of the dorsal nerve root ganglion the axons finally synapse with the neurons of the posterior gray column developing in the alar lamina and leading to the formation of the that is the ascending tracts will be there and here the spinal component of the sensory nerve axon and form the cord
from the white matter of spinal cord so we have seen the development of the uh, tube that is the neural tube afterwards the neural crest cells and later on the development of spinal cord with the differentiation of the root plate floor plate lateral wall differentiation to three on the four functional components divided into in white columns length of the spinal cord at first extend throughout the length of the developing vertebral canal the vertebral column become much longer as compared to the spinal cord with the result that full term at the full term the lower end reaches at the level of third lumbar vertebra this process of recession of spinal cord continues after birth and at that level it reaches at the level of first lumbar vertebra so in the at the age of the eighth week of intrauterine life the length of the vertebral column and the length of the spinal cord is equal but at the age of the 24 week of uh, intrauterine life it reaches up to the first sacred vertebra and the vertebral column increases in size at the age of the birth it reaches at the up to the lower border of the third lumbar vertebra and at the birth it reaches at the lower border of the first here the third lumbar vertebra and at the birth it reaches in adults at the level of the first lumbar vertebra first lumbar vertebra so it is the seen in the equal stages that is up to the eighth week of intrauterine life the spinal cord extending along the whole length of the vertebral canal while in case of the spinal cord that is up to the 24 week it reaches up to the upper border of the sacrum and at the birth the spinal cord reaches at the lower border of the third lumbar vertebra and in adults the vertebral column uh, that is the spinal cord reaches at the level of the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra one effect of this recession of the cord is that the intervertebral foramina no longer lie at the level at which the corresponding spinal now emerge from the spinal cord that is the level of the that therefore the nerves have to follow an oblique downward course to reach the foramina this obliquity is least in case of the cervical nerves and greatest for the sacral and coccygeal nerve here is the diagram these are the equal length of the vertebral column and the spinal cord the nerves will reaches up to the whole level but uh, before the formation of the increase in length of the vertebral column here is the increase in length of the vertebral column so the spinal nerves have to follow a lower down course oblique course so the t7 has to follow lower down course the t11 has to follow up to the lumbar vertebra in lumbar vertebra has, uh, lumbar vertebral spinal lumbar spinal nerves has to go up to the sacral uh, sacral region so this obliquity will increases from the lumbar and the sacral region nerves that is the spinal nerve course taken by the spinal nerve to reach the component and that component is nothing but the level of the intervertebral foramen level of the intervertebral foramen they have to go take a oblique course and through this oblique course they have to reach the the corresponding or the relatively uh, at a lower level of the so intervertebral foramina these are the references reference books thank you